Hello, and it's great to finally be bringing you archives to your town. I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, New South Wales Archives acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hello Tamworth, it's fabulous to be with you, at least virtually. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever it is that you are. So this is how we got here. One of New South Wales State Archives strategies is to engage across the state through our regional network and touring exhibitions. An archives on tour is one of our new ways of really focusing on regional New South Wales. It began in 2018-2019 when we took the 1828 census on tour to some of the areas in New South Wales that are in the census to celebrate it being inscribed on the UNESCO Australian Memory of the World Register. For 2019-2020, we decided to take parts of six of the big series of archives we hold that cover the whole state to six different towns across New South Wales. Well, we all know what happened then. COVID disrupted many, many plans, including archives in your town. So what we decided with this version of Archives on Tour is that at the heart of every town and people are buildings. And in the New South Wales State Archives, we have archives about those people and the buildings of towns across the state. And the archives cover a huge range of subjects and perspectives, and we're going to talk about that today. So we're virtually bringing you archives about the people and buildings of Tamworth. We'll talk about the series and how you can find them on our website and how to access the archives and show you parts of the archives as well. There'll be time for you to share your memories and knowledge and ask us questions. Out of the literally, and I mean literally millions of archives we hold, we've picked just a few to show. Archives in your town has its own page on our website. So you can browse the digital versions of the archives we talk about at your own pace later. So where are we going? As Emily said, we're in Tamworth today. And then we're going to Dubbo, Broken Hill, Tweed Heads, Comer and Wagga. We've worked with the staff from the Central Northern Regional Library right from the beginning. I want to thank them for being so willing to be involved. They've suggested some of the people and buildings and provided some background information. So these are the archives we're going to be looking at. School files, plans of public buildings, theatres and public halls files, bankruptcy files, deceased estate files and probate packets. So let's get into it. NRS 3829 are the school files. They cover 1876 to 1979. They contain a whole range of information, particularly when you think that's a whole cent or more than a century of content. Huge range of information about the sorts of things that happened in schools, including how the schools worked and how the schools interacted with the community. The later files from 1940s onwards don't contain as much detailed information, particularly about teachers, and are also much more official in tone. But broadly the correspondences from and to teachers, parents, the education department and district officers, other government departments, local members of parliament and the education ministers. So now I'm going to show you a brief video and Emily is going to take you behind the scenes to have a look at school files. So in this file on Durham Bar School, we start with the application and there's actually an inspector's report talking about the establishment of the school, explaining where Durham Bar is. So it's on the Tweed River, talking about it being a fort a farming community, good land and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, people listed in the local community who would promote the local school. Uh, we've got a list of how many students might, might be expected to attend. We've got a map of the school district and where the residents who have children might be living. A lot of correspondence about teachers. They almost feel a little bit like a personnel file 
when these things didn't exist. Um, here for this teacher, William Tashihi, we've actually got a list of his previous employment and comments to do with his promotions and things like that from 1896 back to 1889. We've got a list of families, number of children who were supposed to attend the school and why they weren't attending, often due to the weather or being ill or one because they had a sore foot. Here from 1897, we have um, William Sheehy resigning this time due to his charge of obscene language in the local billiard room and the inquiry that ensued. Correspondence to do with the school site. So talking in 1901 about dedicating two acres as a site for the public school. There's a copy of the portion plan, the crown plan and there's the two acres that they're going to dedicate for this school. So the files are listed in our online schools and related records index. They're just called administrative files and they cover those years 1876 to 1939, 1940 to 1979. You can also pick them up through the catalogue so you can pre-order them for the reading room. Because of their varying size, we don't offer them through the copy order service, but it is something you need to come into the reading room to have a look at. And because there's so much material about teachers and other, other aspects of the school, they work really nicely in hand with the teachers' career cards and the teachers' roles. They work nicely with the school photographs and they also work together with our admission registers, punishment books, and the other resources that we've got from some public schools in New South Wales. So only public schools, um, but well worth a look if you're researching the history of a local community, because so often the school is the community and the community is the school. Now, let's talk about Tamworth schools. All of these schools that I've listed in the order in which they opened are still open. And naturally there are more schools in Tamworth now. There are similarities between all of the school files. They reflect their times. Both wars, but particularly World War I is strongly represented. Women having to resign if they marry, the depressions, and the expanding and decreasing populations. But they also reflect their town. As Tamworth grows in population and in area, so does the need for schools, and that's specifically reflected in the files. As a major town, children travel to Tamworth for schooling and need somewhere to live. Some school files are up to 15 boxes of papers. Some are only a couple of centimetres thick, like the one that Emily was looking at. The file for Tamworth Public School is over a metre of paper, and that's just the public school. I've selected a very small quantity of papers from each of these schools, and they've been digitised and put onto the Tamworth archives in your town page. So let's look at some of the pages. This is Tamworth Public School. New school buildings were approved in 1875 for what would become more formally the Tamworth Public School. So the Council of Education have resolved that they will you know, go ahead with that. And then in red, you can see the more practical aspects of how that's going to be managed. So as to the arrangement of the proposed school, i.e. internally, as regards departments, so by that they meant the infants department and the primary department, what materials, what about the teacher's residence because the teacher almost always lived on site and as to the means of obtaining a married first class teacher for the school, so the much more practical level. As part of the new buildings, a new bell was required and the cast iron desk legs to support the desks and they all came by steamer from Sydney and you can see here's the receipt for how it happened. Uh, from Sydney to Newcastle and then by Cobb and Co to Quindry. Presumably then local carters would have picked it up and taken it to Tamworth. The bell was late in arriving but as this PS that I've clipped from a letter, a two-page letter from the manufacturer, the bell's manufacturer feels it was not all his fault. So PS, I also 
I wish to also state that my that they hardly ever send for the bell until they are ready to ring the children into school. Moving into 1880, so that building from the 1870s is already in need of repair. The back wall of the primary school room at Tamworth is in a dangerous state, having been forced out of perpendicular by the spreading of the roof. And just to highlight the real need, they gave us a great snapshot of the attendance at the time. So in 1880, in March, the average attendance, and that would be a, in a day, was 108.9 primary school children and 75.4 infants children. And in June, it had grown a bit, 119.1 and 95.1. In small towns, the wife of the schoolmaster was often employed as a sewing mistress, but of course, Tamworth is not a small town. So here, despite a good application, and that's a letter you can see on the left of the screen, and many references, which is just fascinating, the people that she's managed to get to make to your reference, they decided not to employ Mrs Cornish. And you can see in the letter on the right, um, that basically the suggestion was to employ any other equally or more qualified person. And that shows that Mrs Prince, having been appointed as a sewing mistress in the school. So I think just trying to make sure that they were being more fair in a town of a greater size. Water shortages are nothing new in South, New South Wales, but in 1881, a dry spell of Tamworth Public School with no water for the pupils. And so you can see first the letter from the head. Um, the fact that there is no water in the school tank for the daily consumption of the pupils attending this school under my charge. <laughs> There has been no supply for the last five weeks and the children have been obliged to carry water to the school. Then a newspaper article where the father of a family that attended the school wanted to bring attention to this fact that the water was missing. Um, he mentions that Mr Cornish, the master, very kindly allowed his pupils to quench their thirst from his well. But for the past three weeks, Mr Cornish has been obliged to buy water for his own use. And that's scarcely reasonable to suppose that he should purchase water for the daily use of some hundreds of children. What is to be done? Here we have one of the finest schoolhouses in the country, which certainly ought to take a higher position amongst schools than it does, but which bids fair to go down rather than up because the children attending are being starved for want of water. Many of Mr Cornish's pupils come from a long distance off, even two miles to our knowledge. And from the time they leave home till they return, they must depend upon the charity of strangers for a drink of water. You'll notice the inspector often used red. And in essence, the inspector is saying, yes, we know. We've, you know, put in place to have the tank repaired, but I would now advise in addition that they be empowered, and this would be Mr Cornish, to obtain two casks, which cost about a pound, and to purchase water for the use of the school until the supply in the tank has been replenished. Established in 1880 as an idea across the state, evening public schools were designed to provide an elementary education for persons over 14 years of age who previously received little or no education. They offered young men, because in practice, very few female, females were absolutely allowed to roll, but in practice didn't two hours of instruction, three nights a week. They were usually conducted in the local public school building by the headmaster or other teachers. In essence, most of those schools that did start were poorly attended. And you can understand that after having worked all day, wanting to go and spend three nights a week having instruction may not have seemed very appealing. The Tamworth Evening School only operated in 1884. So the petition was successful. And the wonderful thing is that you can see here a list of the people that were likely to attend. And in some cases, you'll also see a counter signature from their father. So Alfred Walter was 20 and a coach smith and his brother F. Walters was 16, was a printer. John Cleary had three children who might attend John Cleary Jr, who was 16 and a grocer, 
Pat Cleary 13, a grocer, and Thomas Cleary 12, who's a printer. And I know it, it's quite fascinating to see the roles that these, what we would consider today, in most cases, children had at the time. During the time before Tamworth High School opened in 1919, there was much comparison of Tamworth with other towns who were requesting a high school and or more accommodation in their schools. So prior to the time the high school opening, Tamworth Public School was either a, became either a superior school or a district school, as did Tamworth West Public School. And that meant that they would have had infants primary and taught some higher subjects for those older children. And this is what they're looking at here, is the number of pupils in attendance at advanced courses in these towns. And as you can see, Broken Hill tops the list well and truly with 252 pupils, while Tamworth was at the bottom with 98. I haven't done a population comparison and that obviously would be a useful thing to look at. The second factor, which I think does make sense, namely the percentage of total enrolment of pupils who have passed beyond the first years, Tamworth fares slightly better, whereas Broken Hills dropped from the top of the list to the bottom. Still, it was pretty clear from, as you can see, as early as 1913, that a high school was going to be necessary in Tamworth. So this is a small plan on the left showing the dedicated public school on the bottom right. The area that they're obviously thinking about as an extension on the top left. And then on the top right, what is thought of as being the high school site. And this nice little drawing of what a proposed high school might look like, which is quite fancy. So some aspects of life in 1918 are really quite similar to now as reflected through these files, but some are really quite different. And the next few slides looks at that. This is the only record about this event in the school farm. So it's a telegram from the recruiting minister to the Minister for Public Instruction saying, will you please forward authority close Tamworth, Tamworth West Schools Monday afternoon 13th instant sham fight, fight, sham fight marching army. And this is in May 1918. So went off and did some research. The schools were closed at short notice to enable everyone to see and provide hospitality for the men of the March to Freedom column at Tamworth. So there was a recruitment march going on through at least the Northwest and New England. Soldiers and artillery were actually marching to war and recruiting as they did on the way. The march also staged sham fights and they sounded like they were pretty serious. Tamworth suffered the same fate as Armadale and were defeated by the invading army. The sham fight was witnessed by thousands of townspeople and children. The shops, offices and schools were being closed. From our perspective, of course, we know that the war ended before the end of 1918, but they're still actively recruiting in May 1918. For something that probably is much more familiar to all of us today, many people would now still be attending school events to raise money. There was a school concert to be held at the end of 1919 in the Theatre Royal to raise money for Tamworth Public School. Um, this is an application because the principal who at that stage was Mr Telfer had to get permission to do so. And it's obviously been approved and enclosed with it as part of the approval request was the proposed concert program. Again, something's really quite familiar. Um, there's, well, perhaps not a kazoo band, but a band for the senior boys, um, swing song and dance by the fourth and fifth girls, recitation by one particular student, the kindergarten game, The Princess, um, nursery rhymes being performed by the kindergarten. And then the second part is going to be an operetta called Woodland Glend by the senior boys and girls. Again, less similar to today, and these are actually not uncommon throughout the school file. So this is a request from Gladys Marsh, who's an assistant teacher, has the honour to apply for two days leave of absence from duty during the month of June to enable me to meet my brother returning from active service by the transport Sardinia. So people wanting to be in Sydney to meet family members coming back from the war. The leaves approved, but you can notice down in the bottom left hand corner, the leaves approved without pay. 
Tamworth High School plans from 1919. Some of the public building plans are really nicely coloured like these plans. These are actually from within the school files. Some are not as attractive. And looking at photographs of Tamworth, I think that building is still in existence, but is part of the primary school now. The level of detail can be quite amazing, and particularly depending on the, um, the request. There was a request for manual training. The principal had provided this really detailed list of all of the teachers, what they taught, how many periods, to demonstrate that no one there had the capacity. That um, request was knocked back. But it shows, for instance, that uh, Mr. Parr taught 11 periods of history, nine periods of geometry, three of arithmetic and three of algebra. So it gives you quite a good picture of what's being taught. And it is quite different in many ways from the way our lessons would be structured now. Many of the larger towns like, New like Tamworth had hostels so that children could stay in town and attend school. Um, E.G. Dengate, obviously a builder and contractor from Tamworth, this is in 1946, has been called in to have a look at a proposed building for a hostel for the girls. He's dealing with the principal of Tamworth High School. Um, if you're looking at the files on the Archives in Your Town Tamworth page, you may come across E.G. Dengate again. Um, his summary is the property is in splendid repair, structurally sound good position and it's previously been altered and used as a boys hostel so it doesn't require much difficulty so that did go ahead. This is a much more well, slightly mundane matter but only if you weren't staying there from 1957 where an inspection of the bedding has led them to the decision that the old Kapok filled tick mattresses have really um, been used for long enough and need to be replaced. So they're going to get inner spring mattresses, which possibly was a great day for the girls staying there. So now looking at Tamworth West Public School, there was a petition in 1881. So that was how people were able to say, we need a school in this area. And there was, as you can see, printed form. Um, there was often a committee brought together And then on the left is the summary from the inspector who's received this petition. And I think it gives us a little picture of West Tamworth at the time. The residents follow various occupations. So he's saying that it's not something won't change and all of them will have to leave because of lack of employment, are in fair circumstances, so able to support their children to go to school and have a permanent interest in the locality. And here are a couple of extracts from the petition. So the petitions literally have the name of the parent or guardian, the distance from the school, the names and ages of the children and the religion. There's 12 pages of parents and children in this petition listing just over 250 children. So you could see there's a fair need for West Tamworth Public School. And this is a little plan of where they were thinking of citing the school between the church on one side and some houses on the other side. You may have been not very excited by having a school sited right near them. This is about Arbor Day. So Arbor Day is a day about encouraging individuals and groups to plant trees. And it's been observed in Australia since 1889. I think it's less commonly observed. Other things are possibly doing the same thing, but it, with a different name. I'm not sure if these are the parents that are subscribing or the children or a mix of the two. So there are five pages of subscription lists in aid of West Tamworth Arbor Day. So it's an absolutely fascinating resource to see who was at the school um, and probably giving you a little bit of an indication of how well they were doing financially at the time. This is another thing quite common in this time period, this is in 1898, less common now, but on the other hand, closing schools is quite topical. So there was measles in the teacher's family. The teacher reports measles in his family and that it is impossible for him to isolate himself from the patient. So the remainder of the staff is not competent to manage the school in his absence and no substitute is available in my district. And so the inspector is saying, I have therefore directed him to close school during the coming week unless otherwise directed by you. 
Tamworth Public School, obviously, uh, West Tamworth Public School, obviously becoming quite popular by 1949. There were 28 children that they didn't enrol in kindergarten because they were lacking enough teachers. And as this plan shows, more buildings were being added. It's also a great picture of what was there in 1948, even down to where there were shrubs and roses and shrubberies and lawns. So Tamworth continues to grow and we're looking now at Oxyvale Public School, it opened in 1947. It was originally called Manila Road, Woolamole. Here are two excerpts from a letter from the headmaster setting out six reasons for changing the school's name. And this is in 1956. So Mr Cecil George Love, the headmaster, is suggesting that when there is an official opening of the new school that the name be changed from Manila Road, Woolamall to Oxyvale Tamworth. One of the reasons related to the Manila Road reference, because it's, it's a long road, so I wasn't very good at indicating where the school was. Quite a bit of the mail either ended up in Manila or in Woolamin, which was another small town. But this is a really indicative of the time reason. It's 1956 and Tamworth would have been just one of the larger regional towns experiencing this sort of growth and problems. So Woolamall has an odium attached to it due to the presence on the other hillside opposite of Temporary Housing Commission ex-Army huts. This affects the attitude of Tamworth people to the area and has made the adjustment and orientation of the school population within the Tamworth community very difficult indeed because the school takes part in all of the usual sorts of Tamworth things. So the school name was changed. Moving on to Tamworth South, which opened in 1952. And this is an extract from a petition for a school at Tamworth South, or as they said, Hillview or Fairview in 1950. This 14 pages of names of parents and children, and this is just a little summary at the end. So there's 188 children aged from four to 14 within two miles of the selected site and another 140 children under four years of age in the same sort of area. And the prospects for future development. The area which will be served by the school has expanded terrifically since the war. It has had more new homes built in its area than the rest of Tamworth combined. Very large areas here have been subdivided and constitute the only substantive area available for expansion in the Tamworth district. So really clearly, this is going to need a school. There's already a lot of children who could be attending or will attend. So the school was approved and opened in 1952. There were some teething problems and that's not unreasonable. I have to report that the school opened today with 188 pupils you'll note exactly the number that had been mentioned on the petition. Furniture has been supplied for 160 only. In terms of staffing, one teacher had been transferred from West Ham with infants and one casual appointed. These together with the headmaster, an assistant appointed by you constitute the whole staff. So that's for 188 children. There's only five rooms, which seems to be a problem and then he's listing how the grades are. So there's 58 children in kindergarten. The first class has 48 children, the two, three, 56, and the four, five, 36. So they're the 1952 grades, but there'll be an increased enrolments in 1953. And of course the need for additional high schools was also pressing. So Oxley High School, was planned as what is listed here as a standard thousand high school. So that's the standard high school that you require if you've got about a thousand students. It's quite a detailed list. So three different sorts of ordinary classrooms, two different sorts of art rooms, music rooms, library suite, library annex, senior study centre seven science laboratories, cookery rooms, needlework rooms, woodwork rooms, metalwork rooms, descriptive geometry and drawing rooms, and then accommodation for the staff, for master's offices, staff studies, staff common room, a senior pupils common room. I didn't realise they went back as far as 1967. 
the administrative material. So the normal capacity would be 37 classes. Now, unless specified, they're recommending that stage one should be open in 1967, stage two, 68, and stage three in 1970. It cost just over a, a million, and it looks like it was finished completely in 1972, which is two years beyond their original plan. Okay. So, how do you find the school files other than going to the Tamworth Archives in Your Town page? So, our website's www.records.nsw.gov.au. There's a quick links box on the home page, and one of the links in there is the online indexes. So, click on S for schools, click on schools in the list of topics, scroll down to the schools and related records index, and click on search. You can just type in the name of the school or the name of the town and press enter. The school files are listed as administrative files. We're going to move to plans of public buildings. So the colonial architect started in 1832 and continued on as a government architect to the end of the 19th century. These buildings have got many purposes. So all of the things that the New South Wales government did from 1832, and it's a really wide range. And all of these buildings are often large and enduring, even if their purpose changes over time. So they do tend to still be in towns. So we're going to let Emily take us behind the scenes. of these in our collection and 438 of them have been digitised and you can find the digitised copies in collection search. The plans are of all sorts of public buildings from all over New South Wales, so things like police stations, courthouses, jails, public schools, public buildings like land offices, post offices, some of those big buildings that you might know in the city like the Registrar General's Office, the Colonial Secretary's Building and the Treasury Buildings are all included in these plans. But there are some plans that are closed to public access if they're of a security building like a jail or a police station or a courthouse that is still operating as a jail, police station or a courthouse, for example. So we do hold plans of Long Bay Jail and those plans are still closed to public access because Long Bay Jail still operates as a jail. And some of those very old country police stations as another example where the police are still inhabiting the building, those ones would be closed. But there are a lot that are open to public access. Have a look at Tamworth's building. So this is the land board, the land board district survey and roads office in Tamworth. So this is a plan of from the time it was designed. It was designed by the government architect Walter Vernon in 1898. So it's a really, I think, a, a, as they often are, of course. Um, buildings have fashions as much as anything else. So it's a long, low building, it's got courtyards, it's got verandas, so it's a reflection of the fact that this is a building that, you know, can provide protection from the elements. And the other building, other plan, is from when it was altered in 1915. And this is great because it gives us more detail about the inside of the building. So you can see that there's a let on the, the right, the land office where people possibly would have come in to do business with um, the staff of the lands department. Above that, there's a very large drafting room with the surveyor's office beside it. 
I did notice the strong room is beside the lavatory, which, you know, heist movie would be a problem. Um, there's a, a boardroom. So the local landlord would have actually met in the boardroom. The chairman has their own room next door to that. So this building is still in existence and I, it has been owned by Tamworth Regional Council for a number of years. So you can search in two ways, um, either type NRS 4335 and just a town name into collection search. And as Emily said, there's um, a large number that are listed on there. You can also, for earlier ones, look in the online indexes through that quick links box on the home page, and it's under A for architecture and design. Um, some plans are digitised and available to view online, but not all plans are listed online. So if you're interested in a particular building, you could use our Ask an Archivist um, uh, inquiry service through the website and get a reply about them in that way possibly. The theatres and public halls. So this is the last of our building sections. So theatres and public halls, are private buildings. They're not owned by the government or run by the government. And you can see the files cover, again, nearly a century of time. But they had to be licensed, which is why we have records about them. The licensing and regulations all pretty much relate to public safety. They're owned by a huge range of different sorts of people and different kinds of people. Private individuals, businesses, religious organisations, community groups and councils and used for many, many purposes. This is, I'm sure, anything but an exhaustive list. Dances, social gatherings, showing movies is a really common one. Live entertainment and somewhat surprisingly, I think, skating, both roller skating and ice skating. They also provide information about local businesses, both in relation to the theatres and public halls, but also naturally to the building industry. You'll also see police and fire brigades playing their roles in inspections. And they're part of that large, pay a large part of the recreation in any town. And so the rise and fall of these buildings charts both the population sometimes in towns, but also the broader way in which we do um, have fun in the way that people, what they wanted to do for recreation. So we're going to have a look at a video. Here today what we've got is the file for the Capitol Theatre in Wagga. This file starts in 1929 when they were thinking about building the theatre and it carries all the way up to 1966 when they were thinking of pulling it down to put a coals over the top of it. A proposal to build an A-grade theatre at Wagga. It's talking about the location of the site and why it's such a good site. Um, and also the plans for what they intended to build on the site. So they were looking at that stage at, to accommodate up to 1,500 people um, and saying that the site faced Gurwood Street. The police have been asked to provide a report they're inspecting public premises as well. So another evidence of other work that they did. Um, here we've got more of a fire inspection, looking at the different appliances and where they were. Here we go, we've got blueprints of the heating arrangements. Then here we've got details about how often they could show pictures here. So every night from sun Monday to Saturday and a matinee twice a week um, and no other uses for the licensed premises in question. So it was just to be used for the movies really, this one. We've got some lovely letterheads going through. And one interesting thing that happens with these, that some of these theatres and public halls start off as individual halls or theatres that over time were taken over and became part of a chain that might be through one particular area. Here is the plan of the Capital Theatre. The lounge seat. 
seats and the dress circle seats. The boxes. And a stage. Some of these theatres would have been used for schools and other organisations as well. Sometimes public halls were actually used to house, house classrooms as towns expanded. Um, and so you can see some evidence of that. Here we've got a letter informing the authorities that the, the name was going to change from JK Capital Theatres to Hoyt's Country Theatres Proprietary Limited. So and the file continues onwards to 1965-1966 and at that time the theatre was closed down as it was sold in 1965 by Hoyts, which we can see here uh, was GJ Coles and they were going to build a supermarket at that location. So let's talk about Tamworth's very own Capitol Theatre. Capitol Theatre was built in 1927 on Brisbane Street as a movie theatre and operated as one until 1966. Again, these are just some of the pages we've digitised. We haven't digitised the entire file. The theatres and public halls files are also really quite substantial. So this is very early on. This is in 1927 that we're looking at here. And it is in essence, and I've just cut the letter so that it will fit on the screen, about installing new seats. And as you can see, the letterhead is fantastic. Good theatre seating essential to success. Next to clear vision of the stage and screen, the patron's first concern is personal bodily comfort, which is probably perfectly true when you're going to the cinema. So, even in terms of the seating, and these were larger seats, there was necessary to get permission from the government to ensure that they weren't in any way going to obstruct the ability of people to get out, and also were they comfortable. Now the sharp-eyed amongst you will have noticed that these plans are pretty much exactly the same as the plans on the Wagga Capital Theatre file, which makes perfect sense. If you're going to go building um, theatres around the state, you don't necessarily need to have to do a separate one. So looking at the naming, so the JK Capital Theatre and also the kind of the font, I think these probably are really quite early from the 1920s, even though there's no date. And you can see that they've been altered later. So we've got the downstairs where the orchestra would have been and you could see that basically the alterations are in essence to take out a row of seating so it would be possible for people to exit to the exits rather than having to go all the way down to the front. And then upstairs you can see it's quite a flash theatre. There are two boxes both of which have got five seats. I'm not quite sure they would have had great views of the the um, movie, but you never know. And then the dress circle, which the seats are not quite as tightly packed in. This is a later plan from a really different perspective. It's from May 1937. There often seems to have been changes being planned or requested. So I think in essence, there was always a little bit of tension. This is really common across all of the, particularly the movie theatres, tension between the proprietor wanting maximum number of seats naturally and people who are concerned about the safety and the regulations wanting to reduce them. And you can see that reflected here. So in 1936 it was found that the seating numbers had been ex exceeded so that the authorised seating was 930 and 653 10 extra, oh, 10 in the boxes, of course, and the actual seating was over a thousand downstairs and 772 upstairs. So 1941 on review, the stall seatings was approved at 992 and the licensee was directed to reduce the gallery to 650 in view of the inadequacy of the exits and that was done. And while they were there doing an inspection in November 1936, they also pointed out that um, the ceiling and roof construction should be examined. And so at least that was being inspected at the time. So 
also again like the Capitol Theatre in Wagga, who bought this theatre and eight other theatres across regional New South Wales from Mr J.K. Cavillis in 1946 and it lists the theatres. So obviously the licensing, um, the Theatres and Films Commission of part of the Chief Secretary needs to know who is holding the licence. So the Capitol and Plaza Theatres in Wagga, the Strand Theatre in Young, the Capital and Regent Theatres in Tamworth, Capital Theatre in Farrell, Capital and Garden Theatres in Moray, and the Capital and Arcadia Theatres in Armidale were all moved on to um, Hoyts. In 1970s, it was used as a discotheque with amusement machines in the foyer. So again, that change of the things that people wanted to do in their recreational times. And later still, the Salvation Army used the building to store secondhand clothes. And you can see the other image on this screen is from the final police report. So um, JC Harding, Sergeant Third Class, has done an inspection in on the 28th of May 1973 and says this hall has not been used for the showing of films for the past seven years. Originally, there were approximately a thousand fit seats in stalls and 500 in the gallery. The gallery seats remain, but all seats have been removed from the stalls. It's understood that the building is shortly to be sold by Hoyts and it will never again be used for the showing of films. And that was true. Like many of these theatres across the whole of the state, it did not survive and it was demolished in 1984. So how to find the theatres and public halls files. So the series number is NRS 15318. Actually, I've forgotten to say NRS stands for New South Wales Records Series. You don't have to use that as a search, but if you, and you can um, filter within collections actually, you could just type in Tamworth. But if you just want to look at theatres and public halls files, that's a great quick way to do it. All of the files are listed online, but no, none of the files are digitised and because of their really variable size and the very variable size of their contents, like large plans, we don't offer a copy service for those. So we're now going to move on to talking about people and do that through three different sorts of files, bankruptcy files, deceased estate files and probate files. So bankruptcy is that formal state in which a person's unable to pay creditors and is required to undergo a legal process that usually results in liquidation of his or her estate in order to meet expenses, at least in part, and in most cases, it's definitely in part. So looking at what bankruptcy can tell us beyond just about that person, bankruptcy files contain lists of creditors that the bankrupt person owed money to and debtors that owed money to the bankrupt person. And through these lists, they show great commercial connections in a town, between towns and with Sydney. And I think particularly in some ways, the within town, uh, between towns is one of the great things, that who was trading with who in, you know, how far outside Tamworth were people working. The bankrupt person provides a statement about why they became bankrupt, often providing a picture of what's happening in the town and beyond. The files of bankrupt people in a town collectively show the sorts of businesses that were operating, even if they were not necessarily successful businesses, but that in itself is quite an interesting point. So we're going to, Emily will be taking us again. So we hold quite a good collection of bankruptcy files. They cover from 1888 up to 1928. This particular file I've got in front of me is for a man called Elijah Alexander who went bankrupt in Broken Hill in the 1890s. So the files contain a lot of repetitive material because at the base it's really about how much money was owed by the bankrupt and how much money could they get back from their creditors and give their debtors. Okay, so usually there's a statement on the file to where the bankrupt gets a chance to explain what led up to their current unfortunate situation. So he says he was recently the licensee of the Freemasons Hotel at Broken Hill and he's the bankrupt. He filed a statement of his affairs with the registrar in Sydney and he 
goes through a list of creditors that owe him money. He says he was insolvent previously in 1881. He attributes his bankruptcy to sickness in the family and the drought in 1891-92. Um, and the Broken Hill strikes by which his house was boycotted and also losses on a contract to provide food for free labourers on the mines during the strikes. Um, he had three partners and he, he and his partners lost £670 by a contract. Due to a range of issues with the partnership, he took possession of the hotel in 1891 um, he gave the company £1,036 in cash and then proceeded to spend quite a bit of money on the hotel. Had to value all the furniture and effects in the hotel. He says he's been out of employment since the whole thing started. And we do remember too that in 1891 there was also a depression. So I'm sure that did not help matters at all. So here we've got a lot of creditors unsecured um, and the kinds of people who were creditors were brewers and merchants and wine merchants, tea merchants, chaff merchants. We've got debts to the estate. Some of these people, I th or possibly most of these people might be people who just owed the hotel money for drinking debts perhaps. Uh, so there's quite a people working at the proprietary mine who all owed like one and two pounds, three pounds sometimes. Here we have a list of goods that were bought of Alex Marshall, the wholesale and family butcher in Broken Hill, prime beef. And looking through it, we notice that there's a lot of cooked beef, there's mutton, there's raw beef, mints, giving us an idea of what people ate when they went to the hotel in Broken Hill in the 1890s. Huskerson and Co. We've also got food, so things like raisins and vinegar, uh, thyme, flour, rice, oatmeal, quarter of a ton of sugar, would you believe, sago, turmeric, allspice, currants. Lots of proofs of debt from various creditors and these sorts of things. Um, as we just saw, the invoices from and the letterheads from the creditors can be quite beautiful pieces of art in themselves. The names of everyone who's got a bankruptcy file in this period are listed in our online indexes and in our catalogue. So you can search for the name and the location of the person. The person we're going to talk about from Tamweb. So George Abbott Solomons was a photographer in Tamworth. He was declared bankrupt in, on the 29th of August, 1893. He stated the cause of his bankruptcy as falling off of his business, sickness in his family, and through not being able to collect his debts. So his unsecured liabilities, so what he owed, were just over 114 pounds and his unencumbered assets were only 84 pounds. So he obviously couldn't meet his debts. Very little of that was realised as his creditors allowed him to retain his household furniture, his tools of trade and his wearing apparel. So that's really quite generous of the people that he owed money to. His part of George Albert Solomon's um, trading accounts. So um, the trading accounts that he's provided as part of his bankruptcy process start in August 1891. And so that you can see in August 1891, he took in, and it's a monthly record, two pounds, four shillings and sixpence. September, not as good a month, uh, a better month, I should say. Seven pounds, October 12, November 10, December 15. Wondering whether that relates in some way to Christmas. And then his 
disbursement. So what has he bought in that same period? So he spent 10 pounds on clothing, some expenses for traveling. Middleton was a person who worked for him. So I think it must only be part of, oh yes, just for the last week of the month. Um, so one pound 10 for wages for Middleton. Some repairs, timber, material enameling, which was used in the photographic process. Um, so it looks like Middleton's wages for a whole month of four pounds. Uh, Doherty and Mrs. Jamison was rent, obviously for premises, presumably, then store goods, more rent, store goods. So you get an, this amazing picture, as I said, of the commercial interactions of this person through these records. So these are the summary of George Solomon's unsecured creditors, and they reflect some of the problems that he was having. So George Solomon's wife, Annie, and two of their children, Lilla and Archibald, had all died of typhoid in 1892. And you can see that the top um, creditor is George Branson, who's a monumental mason, and that's for 18 pounds. So that's the balance still, so only the balance still to be paid on headstones, fences and fixings for obviously where his family were buried. Um, then the sorts of things that you'd expect, photographic goods that he needed to carry out his um, business, timber merchant, a dealer in Sydney, upholster, um, photographic material, tailor, shopkeeper, and then, as you would rather expect, given the illness in his family, a doctor. So again, that showing who he's dealing with, people in Tamworth, people in Glen Innes, um, Newcastle, Sydney, that um, economic web. Newspaper proprietor for advertising, um, photograph engraver, or gilding, presumably to decorate the photographs. There was another Solomon's photographer, obviously operating in Armadale. Printers, plumbers, machinists. So again, it's like a little list of who was doing what business in the town at the time. Then these are the debts due to George Albert Solomon's estate. So there's nearly 40 pounds of small quantities of money were owed by various people across New England. And presumably these are for photographs or other things bought from him. So you can see that Miss Osmond near Glen Innes, um, it was a bit of a doubtful. So the debts are sorted by good, doubtful and bad. So the good is where, you know, they've said there's some expectation that that might be able to be regathered. Doubtful, doubtful and the bad, there's not very likely to see that money. Um, owed seven and six. Um, Mr. Dixon, also from Nick Leninus, 10 shillings. Um, the Great Northern Railway, Mr. Wright. So a list of basically, obviously, we presume that he did a trip to Glendinus and sold material there. And there must have been other people, presumably that he did get paid by, but not everyone. And I think this is where George Solomon's bankruptcy fits into the times. The 1890s were a time of depression across Australia and possibly it was the most severe in our history. So it's not just him that is possibly struggling a bit for money. There would be other people, including the people that he was doing business with. I will note that the debts do go back to the 1880s. Um, so George Solomon's bankruptcy was discharged in 1900. So it took a while for him to come around, but he did, which is great to know. So if you do want to have a look for a bankruptcy file, look on our website, look in the online indexes through the quick links box. It's under B for bankruptcy and the topic is called bankruptcy insolvency. So we do have insolvency records. They're similar, but not quite the same. And they cover 1842 to 1887. You can just search the index either for a person or if you want to see what was happening in Tamworth in relation to those two indexes, just type in the town name center and you'll get lots of hits. I'm going to move on to the deceased estate files. So 
The Stamp Duties Office created a deceased estate file for every individual who died leaving property or other assets which were subject to death duty. So these are really the files that were created to decide whether or not death duty would be charged on an estate between 1880 and 1958. They're really a financial record of the person's estate when they die and they often have very detailed information about a person's possessions. So this time it's going to be Martin. He's going to take us behind the scenes. Hi everyone and welcome to this next instalment of our Archives Behind the Scenes videos from New South Wales State Archives. We're in cell 10, uh, the famous green cell, not only because it has a green floor and green shelves, but even green labels on all of the boxes that are in here as well. One of the highlights of the State Archives collection that are held in this cell are around 7,000 boxes of deceased estate files from the Stamp Duties Office. These are files that were created when death duty was payable in New South Wales. The series of files dates from 1880 through to the late 1950s, and they are a financial record of someone's estate when they died. So in order to establish how much death duty was payable on an estate, that estate had to be valued in some way. And in order to provide that value, you had to list out and enumerate all of someone's real estate, their personal belongings, and their other personal estate. And that's exactly what these deceased estate files are. They're a financial record, but a real treasure trove of information. Now you can access indexes to the deceased estate files on our website, and also on the websites of our partners, Ancestry and Find My Past. So between those three websites, and our website address is www.records.nsw.gov.au, you should be able to find an entry for anyone that you might be interested in, in the deceased estate files. Anyway, what sort of information do they show? Come a little bit closer, and I'll show you an example of one of the files. So this is the file for John Henry Williams, who dies in Sydney in Randwick in 1945. His file typically comprises an overall value of his estate and then the paperwork to do with the administration of his estate and that whole process of enumerating the estate. So page upon page of details of this person's estate. What's really interesting about this example, and it's by no means an unusual example, is the wonderful listing of all of the personal estate that was contained when John Henry Williams died in 1945. So you'll see listings here of furniture, of cushions, of curtains, of glassware, and a value for each item. Because that's exactly what these files are, remember, is a financial record of someone's estate. So they're a wonderful source of information because they tell you how someone was living at the time of their death and what objects, what estate, what real estate, what personal estate they left when they died. Bye for now. So the deceased estate files, absolutely fantastic. There were deceased estate files for people from all walks of life, men and women, all ages or financial positions. The deceased estate files in the probate packets are what we'll look at next. To cover, they basically, between them, cover the wrap up of a person's estate when they die. Probate packets show what happens to the estate, so who inherits. The deceased estate files are about calculating death duty. There's overlap between the two series, but if there's a packet, um, both of the files exist for a person, definitely look at both. Provide great information about a person and how they live their life. A lot of information also about the town the person lived in, what businesses there were, who knew who and who dealt with who, what sort of housing there was. The two deceased estate files I'm going to talk about, one's from the 1880s, one from the 1930s. The typical people of their time and their jobs. They both also have probate packets, but we're just going to show the deceased estate file. So Henry Palmer was a grocer in Tamworth and he died in 1884. You can see that He's listed up here. In the deceased estate files, there's almost always one of these affidavits. And for Henry Palmer, it's signed by his wife, Marianne Palmer, that his estate was less than 345 pounds. So let's have a look at some of the detail. So the bulk of his estate is his life assurance money. He obviously had an AMP 
policy and he had also about 12 pounds worth of furniture, so not a great deal. There's a note down here in red that says deceased was never in business and therefore had not any stock in trade. So I think what they mean is that he worked as a grocer, possibly for someone else, rather than he actually owned and ran a grocery shop. Because what they're looking for is if he's a grocer, what stock did he have and what value can we put on that? So that's not the case. His debts were few and just the stuff of life. So he owed money for bread, some money for goods, some money for meat, some money for medicine. And actually these are about, all of these files are probates and the deceased states are about people that have died. It's very common to find um, records of doctors and medication. And he also had a small loan to someone. And that is often the case, you can have a file that is that small, but it still tells you a bit of what's about going on in the town and in that person's life. So the second person I want to talk about is Chow Sum, a tobacco farmer from Tamworth. He died in 1937 and he's age 62. As the deceased estate files go forward, they include sometimes more information. So by this stage, they're providing a date, uh, age I should say. This is a slightly unusual file in that the public trustee signed the affidavit that his estate was just over 553 pounds with over a thousand pounds of debts. And there was a delay in settling the estate as Chow Sum's wife, Mabel Sum, was in China when he died. This is a summary of his assets. So you can see the bulk of his assets are actually 20 bales of tobacco leaf and quarter interest in another 26 bales. And there were 40 bales of tobacco leaf that are considered to be valueless. So whether they hadn't been dried properly or something else, he had money in the bank. There were some debts due to him from um, various people. And he had personal property, farming implements, livestock tools, engines and effects worth 145 pounds. So this is the detailed list of the farming implements and other things that were worth 145 pounds. So it's an amazing picture on what's required to run a tobacco farm in Tamworth in the 1930s. So I put galvanised iron drain, wheelbarrows, well sinking pipe, tobacco poles, ladder, a H wagon, possibly a hay wagon, could be some other sort of wagon, tank, windlass and piping, grindstone, bag of loosened seed and dray. Um, he's got a bay mare and a brown horse, lots of farrows and ploughs, a grader, a scarifier, a roller, um, tobacco box, hay press, hose and shovels, goodness, pigeon and loft, rice iron, tanking and piping, um, all of the sorts of harness that goes with the, the horses. So huge amount of detail about his profession. This is the list of his debts. So the biggest debt, 465 pounds, is for rent and a lien on that and also some interest. Um, he's got a range of debts for people that he's bought goods from. He's got a loan to his wife. Um, and again, it's the names of other people that are in the town, the other companies that give you that broader picture from beyond Chow Sum and into the, the town of Tamworth. There's an amazing letter in his deceased estate file. Um, so basically a statement from his wife who is living at that point. So this is after the death, she may have moved at 507 Peel Street and says this her occupation is home duties. The above named deceased resided with me in New South Wales as my husband from for 17 years. We were married in Canton, China and came straight to New South Wales. As far as I can say, Chow Sum had permanently resided in New South Wales for about 44 years. We resided at Nemengar for about 14 years and prior to that we lived at Tamworth. 
our residence is at both the latter places with a permanent and only residence of myself and my husband. I think, and you can just see down the bottom that she's signed with an X. I think part of the purpose of this statement is to talk, is in relation to the White Australia policy and demonstrating Charles Sum's residence in New South Wales. As Martin said, there's online indexes, so you can get to those through the quick links. Um, under D for deceased estate, click on deceased estate, search the index. Again, you can use a person's name, but if you're interested in the broader perspective, search the town name. Our index covers 1880 to 1939, but the files cover 1880 to 1958. So for 1940 to 58, try Ancestry.com. We do offer a copy order service for these files and the cost of that is $37.90. Probate packets. So, Grant of probate is the authority given by the Supreme Court of New South Wales to the executors to deal with the deceased person's estate. The great thing, if there's a will, the will should be there, the last will and testament, any codiciles and any letters of administration. Not everyone has a probate packet. Depending on the size, type, size and value of the assets located in New South Wales may not be necessary to obtain a grant of probate in New South Wales. And there's no statutory requirement to obtain probate in every case, which is one of the things to definitely bear in mind. So we're just going to let Colleen take us behind the scenes. Hi, and welcome to the latest instalment of Behind the Scenes here at New South Wales State Archives. I'm down here in what we call stage five of our facility, which is where we store one of our most popular record series, the probate packets. Probate packets contain the last will and testament of the person who passed away, as well as other administrative documents around settling of the estate. And as you can see, we've got boxes and boxes of them. In fact, we hold probate from 1817 right up to 1976, as well as a bit of 1989. And the remaining packets are held by the New South Wales Supreme Court. So why are they called packets? Well, as you can see, the New South Wales Supreme Court used to store the documents in these envelopes. But they're pretty hard to get out sometimes. And in fact, I can't even get the records out of this one. So now that they're here at the archives, wherever possible, we try to move the records into these white archival envelopes. And they're much roomier and generally much better for the records. So what else can you find in a probate packet? Well, sometimes you can find birth and marriage certificates because people had to prove who they were in order to gain their inheritance, particularly women who may have married. And sometimes you find very unique artifacts in the probate packets. And one of my favorites I'm going to show you now. This is the last will and testament of Cecil Winch, who was a soldier who went off to World War I and unfortunately lost his life in Gallipoli. And he penned his will on the back of the family photo that he carried with him to war. And to me, it's just a poignant reminder of the death and grief that that generation suffered during a horrible time in our history. But don't just take my word for it. If you'd like to go looking for a probate packet for someone in your family, head over to our website, put their name in the search box on the homepage, and don't forget to add the word death. If you have any trouble, have a look at the probate guide on our website under research A to Z, or you're welcome to give us a call or drop us an email. Anyway, it's time for me to get back to work. And of course, the box I want is right up on the top shelf. It's lucky I'm not afraid of heights. See you next time. Okay, let's look at some Tamworth probate packets. These two probate packets, one from the 1940s, one from the 1970s, are typical of people of their time and their roles, while also being special because of who they are. So Vincent Guy Cable, known as Guy Cable, was a long-serving, well-regarded town clerk of Tamworth. Guy Cable was town clerk for 34 years, which is, I think, amazing, and was described by some as the ablest town clerk in the state during his time. He also served on the state's Electricity Advisory Committee and the State Electricity Authority, 
and during the Second World War on the Commonwealth Administrative Planning Committee. So he's made a huge impact both across Tamworth, the state and Australia. He was comparatively young when he died in 1947. He was married with three children. The will that was probated was made in 1946. And I think that it's quite possible when he made that will, he was aware that he may not necessarily have been living for a long time. There is also a deceased estate file, but I'm just going to talk about his probate packet. So this is the first page of the last will and testament of Vincent Guy Cable, Tamworth in the state of New South Wales, town clerk. He appoints his son, Donald Guy Cable, and the permanent trustee company of New South Wales Limited to be his executors and trustees. The whole of the will seems to be aimed at ensuring the best outcome for his family. So he's appointed these trustees to manage his estate and it's quite a substantial estate. It's a three page will. This is the last page where you'll see, as is quite typical, um, talking about that this is his last will and testament and his signature and the uh, signatures and statements of his witnesses to the will. This is really quite a short list of debts, whereas there are quite a few pages of assets shown. Um, so there's chemist accounts, nursing fees, um, drug supplied through Tamworth Hospital, prepaid premium with Tamworth Council, his electricity account, telephone account, sort of reflecting the changing times from those two deceased estate files that we saw, um, a debt in relation to taxation, which hadn't been finished at that time, but this is August, it's not an unusual thing, and some plumbing repairs. Just chose a couple of pages of assets to have a look at. Um, he owned quite a lot of shares, both within New South Wales, as you can see at the top, and also Queensland and Victoria. So that estate will have actually been managed separately. It's one of the things that um, you will find people who lived both overseas and interstate in our records if there was a state in New South Wales to be dealt with. The last one of his assets that I wanted to show because it covers a whole range of things. For anyone who's lost family members, it can be hard to decide how and when to pass part with personal possessions, but to have them valued must be really hard. And this is part of the process of calculating death duties. But it's also a fascinating and a really rare, I think, detailed look at men's clothes in the 1940s, but also reflecting on how that's changed over time. The concept of a good suit and a working suit is probably gone beyond the fact, but you only have to look at some of our old photos to discover that people are building roads dressed in suits that they might take the jacket off occasionally. It also lists um, his watch and his gold um, cufflinks. And the last person I want to talk about. So Ida Cohen was 102 when she died in 1970. Ida Cohen had also, like Guy Vincent, uh, Guy Cable, had lived a life of service, but principally with the Red Cross, for which she received an MBE, a member of the British Empire Award. She was involved with the Australian Jewish Historical Society, the Country Women's Association, Tamworth Hospital Women's Auxiliary, Tamworth Ladies Benevolent Society, Tamworth Dominican Old Girls Union, and Tamworth and District Ambulance Committee. So the bulk of her estate, it's a simpler will, different time of life, is split between her sons, George Victor Cohen and Jack Allen Cohen, bequest to other family members, the donation she's making to the charities that she's worked with. Her will ends on a personal note, saying that her best legacy to her sons is each other, and she included Tamworth as well. She says, to my well-beloved public of Tamworth, each and every one I leave my abiding and most grateful love for its unfailing courtesy, love and generosity to me. So when she made her will in 1967, she's already probably 99 years of age. And I think that's reflected in the, it's a good signature, but it's a signature of an older person. 
This is the certificate of valuation for what was probably the family home. And these certificates of valuation are common in both deceased estate files and probate packets. The family homes in Carthage Street, it's a brick cottage with a galvanised iron double garage, fencing and paving. So looking at the kind of home people are living at in the 1970s. And it is one of those deceased estate files that has absolutely incredibly detailed lists of the furniture throughout the house. Um, I've just chosen the lounge and the kitchen. And two of the things I wanted to highlight, it shows its time. There's both a TV set, still pretty modern in 1970, um, and a Westinghouse refrigerator. Both were worth $60, pounds, uh, $60 we moved into decimal currency. Very expensive items. I mean, if you contrast that with a table, which is worth one pound, could well be an old table, and chairs are worth 50 cents each. But that whole detail of what's in a house, which is common across um, some places, but also less common. Ida Cohen also owned some chairs, including in the Northern Daily Leader. I mainly included this letter because I think it's a great letterhead and it's one of the things that you will find throughout all of these files, again reflecting the commerce in the town. To find the probate packets, you can either type in NRS 13660 or as Colleen said, type in death and the person's name into collection search. All of the files we hold are listed online. None of the files other than for archives in your town are available digitally online. There is a copy order service and the copies cost 53.80. Thanks for joining us to talk about Tamworth and thanks for your comments and questions. Do have a look at the Tamworth Archives in Your Town webpage where you can see more detail from all of those files.